Let's talk about eight of the craziest unsolved heists in modern history. Number eight. On February 28th, 2015, at Amsterdam Cheese Museum. Yes, it's a real thing. Someone stole the Bosque Holland Cheese Slicer, which is far from an ordinary slicer. It's encrusted with diamonds. How many? Great question. Well, it's uh, 220 diamonds, and the slicer itself is valued at over $28,000. Why a museum has such a bougie slicer of all things is beyond my comprehension. Now, the thief was was caught on the museum's security cameras. However, not enough of the bandit was captured on camera to be identifiable. They are now the proud owner of a $28,000 cheese slicer and remain at large. It is one of the weirdest items to be stolen in modern history. Number seven. In August 2017, in a town of Neustadt, Germany, thieves stole a refrigerated truck filled with almost 20 tons of Nutella and Kinder chocolate eggs, which had a total value of almost $60,000. And that's about all the information on the high. It is so peculiar that there's barely any news online. I wonder what they did with all that product though. Were they selling it on the Nutella black market? Were they illegally trading Kinder eggs? So many questions and literally no answers. Oh, and if you already guessed, the thieves were never caught and the goods were never retrieved. Six years later, I'm pretty sure the product has all been consumed. Number six. It's November 24th, 1971, and a man by the alias Dan Cooper, or DB Cooper, was at the Northwest Orient Airlines counter in Portland, Oregon International Airport airport. He purchased a ticket on flight 305 bound for Seattle, Washington using cash. When it was time to board the plane, he settled into his seat 18C with his briefcase in his lap. He asked a flight attendant for a drink while the flight was waiting to take off. 10 minutes after taking off, he handed the stewardess a note indicating he had a bomb in his briefcase. To make it more convincing, he told the stewardess to sit next to him and Dan gave her a sneak peek into the briefcase where she saw a bundle of wires, red colored sticks, and a battery. Dan then told her to write down what he said, and afterwards she went to the cockpit and handed the note over to the captain, which demanded they give D.B. Cooper four parachutes and $200,000 in $20 bills specifically. When the flight landed in Seattle, the hijacker exchanged the flight's 36 passengers for the four parachutes and 200 grand. He then kept several of the flight's crew members as the plane took off for its next stop, Mexico City. Mid-flight, DC figured it was time to dip, so he put on the parachute and jumped out of the back of the airplane with the ransom money, and that's literally all we know about the incident. Yep, the feds opened an investigation immediately, calling it Norjack, but failed to catch the culprit, closing the case 45 years later on July 12th, 2016. Number five. In 2016, there were a series of three high-profile cheese thefts that took place in Wisconsin. If you're asking who goes out of their way to steal cheese, well, apparently more people than you'd expect. As it turns out, cheese theft is surprisingly the most common food item to be stolen. Yeah, apparently yearly, around 4% of cheese produced in the world is stolen. And in the US alone, that would equate to roughly 523 million pounds of cheese stolen annually. Who the hell likes cheese this much? Anyways, back to January 2016, the first heist occurred in Germantown, where 70,000 pounds of cheese were stolen. The cheese was stored in a trailer and was found empty and abandoned later that morning. Now, this cheese was luckily recovered later because the goobers who stole the cheese were trying to sell it at a dollar per pound. This wasn't the last of the cheese banditos. A couple days later, another theft occurred where 41,000 pounds of Le Sueur Parmesan cheese, costing upwards of $90,000, was stolen from a store in Marshfield. What the hell are you gonna do with 41,000 pounds of stolen Parmesan? Sell it on the black market? Are you gonna eat it all? Because hold on, let me get my glasses. Mathematically speaking, the average consumption of cheese is 41.8 pounds per year, which means it would take a human 980 years to finish it all. Ain't no way anyone's eating that much cheese. Now, the police were able to recover the cheese in a warehouse in Grand Chute thanks to an anonymous source, but since the authorities could not determine if the cheese was stored properly when stolen, they they decided that the cheese was not fit for consumption and it had to be destroyed. Man, that sucks. Now, the third heist happened on July 1st, 2016, where a trailer loaded with 20,000 pounds of cheese valued at $46,000 was stolen from a parking lot in Oak Creek. A truck driver had unhitched his trailer to go run a quick errand. When he returned, he found the trailer and the cheese gone. The cheese banditos nor the cheese were recovered yet again. So the total loss of cheese between the last two heists was an upwards of $250,000. Number Four. On December 10th, 1968, in Tokyo, Japan, 
four employees of the Kokobunji branch of Nippon Trust Bank were transporting approximately $820,000 in the trunk of their company car. Now, a man posing as a police officer on a motorcycle stopped the bank employees, informing them that their bank manager's house had been destroyed by an explosion and warning them that an explosive device had been planted in their car. He told the employees to get out of the vehicle and then crawled under the car, acting like he was inspecting it for the bomb. He then ignited a flare under the car, freaking out the poor employees who ran, which gave the imposter time to hop in the car and drive away with the money. Man's really pulled off a GTA heist to perfection because even though it's been half a century, Japanese police have not caught him nor retrieved the money. This man was so slick that the authorities posted 780,000 pictures throughout Japan, had a list of 110,000 suspects, and had 170,000 police participate in the investigation, and yet they still weren't able to catch him. In fact, he was such a smooth operator that in 1988, he was relieved of any civil liability, which meant that he could openly admit to being guilty without fear of arrest or prosecution. But this guy didn't have shit for brains, so of course he's never going to reveal himself, and he is still unknown to this day. Number three, on March 24th, 1999, it was a rainy night in Sacramento, California, as a Loomis Fargo and Company semi-trailer was driving on I-80 from Sacramento to San Francisco, making a routine run to transport money. The truck's cab was armored while the trailer was not, while carrying 270 pounds of cash worth over $2.3 million, which is very important to the story. When the truck was near Fairfield, the crew, including the 58-year-old driver Howard Brown and guards Frank Betancourt and Ken Montgomery, were vibing, not suspecting anything was happening, and so they arrived at the Loomis Depot in San Francisco. Now, when Frank went to the back of the truck to unlock and offload the cash from the trailer, he suspected nothing. Then, as he opened the doors, he <gasps> discovered a large hole in the roof and all 270 pounds of cash gone. Yup, not a trace of the money was left. The FBI was then involved to do a criminal investigation. The only piece of evidence the feds ever found in the unarmored trailer was a worn out Dutch military duffel bag with the initials MOV on it. Oh, and remember when I said that they were vibing in Fairfield as they were driving to San Francisco? Yeah, well, the FBI hypothesized that in Fairfield is where the money was stolen. I don't know how in 1999 they only consider armoring the cab but not the trailer. That is one hell of an oversight for a company whose whole shtick is literally cash management. I'm sure someone got fired at HQ for allowing $2.3 million to just vanish in thin air. Number two, on November 6th, 2012 at 1015 GMT, six people on three bikes rode into, yes, you heard that right, into the Brent Crossing Shopping Center. The robbers wore motorcycle helmets to conceal their identities. Plus, they also got out of half protection with, oh, I don't know, they're riding motorbikes into a mall? These guys are also armed with axes and bats and targeted the Fraser Hart Jewelry Store. They drove the bikes right in front of the store and the passengers hopped off the bikes, smashing the windows of the store and snatching watches, necklaces, and rings, all of which were valued at over $3 million. The passengers then hopped back on the bikes and the six of them beelined it for the shopping center's exit. 15 minutes later, the bikes were found near a golf course and each of the bikes turned out to be stolen. These guys still remain at large and none of the jewelry has been recovered. Number one, on March 18th, 1990, in the early hours of the morning, two men disguised as police officers pushed the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum buzzer, stating that they were responding to a disturbance and requested to be let in. There were two young guards on the shift, Richard Abbott and Randy Heston, and for some reason, Richard was convinced by the police's demands to be let in and decided to break protocol and allow them through, which would turn out to be a wildly expensive mistake. The fake police put the guards under arrest, handcuffed them, and then threw them into the museum's basement. The thieves then worked meticulously for the next 80 minutes to steal 13 of the treasured artworks Isabella had procured over the years. The artworks were retrieved by smashing the glass panels, tearing down the frames, and then slicing paintings from their canvases sloppily. The combined valuation of all the artworks is an estimated worth of $500 million. And all it took were two dudes to fool the guards into letting them in Damn, that is one hell of a paycheck. The thieves made two separate trips to their car to stash all the artworks. They then went back into the museum once they were done and swiped the museum's security VHS tapes. Such outdated tech. I still remember watching Shrek on VHS. That was good times. Anyways, the thieves vanished and the empty frames remain hanging in the museum as an homage to the missing works and placeholders for the artwork's return. To this day, the case remains unsolved. No arrests have been made, nor have any of the artworks been recovered. <laughs>